and welcome to the show with me, Gillian Gotsell. Today, I have a real treat for you, a real OG in the crypto world, Joel Dietz. Thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed today. Pleasure to be here. Well, I am so in awe of you. I am. Um, I didn't know that much about you, I have to confess, which is a great uh, confession to make. And I started digging around. And oh my goodness, you have done so much. You're a founder of MetaMask. You did the legal groundwork for utility tokens. You're a founder member of Ethereum. And you're big into crypto uh, econ economies. Economics, economics. I get the word right in a minute. No, not enough coffee as yet. And I also want to talk about your art wallet. But before I dip into all of these, and there's so much to talk to you about, um, I was watching some videos of you uh, during the week, and I loved the thing you were saying when you were a kid, you went to kindergarten and you were bored. So you went home and to be homeschooled by your mom. Was that pressure on your mom? Yeah, a bit, but I was quite independent already at that sort of stage. And, you know, occasionally they're like, Joel, you need to go out and take some standardized tests. I think it was like once every other year, according to the state of Pennsylvania. And I always did quite well on these standardized tests. And then people were like, okay, Joel can just keep doing whatever he's doing. It seems to be working. So pretty much story of mine. As, as a mom, I'm thinking, oh, my God, the pressure. If my kids say, stay home, I'm going, I've forgotten more than I've ever learned at school. How could I possibly teach them? <laughs> so you're, you're an independent. I mean, I think you, you're saying, too, you sat in front of, the, uh, of your computer a lot. Um, and you grew up in front of, front of a computer, obviously, from where you are here now. And at 13, you won a scholarship to study uh, computer science in a university. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At Arcadia, which is kind of local college near, um, near where I grew up. So you're, I mean, as it goes out saying, incredibly bright, precocious, intelligent, interested. And you said too as well, you learn quickly, but you get bored quickly too as well, which is probably the reason for your huge spread of interest. It's not just in one particular niche. You've gone down many rabbit holes. Um, so uh, can we ask just a couple of questions to ask you? An artist, you're an artist. I've looked at some of your stuff on your website. What inspires you and what type of art do you enjoy doing most? Um, I would say I have a very like classical romantic temperament even, which sometimes is hard to bring into the modern world since, you know, romantically inclined people are sometimes suppressed in the modern economy. Um, but uh, I also just love the cutting edge of technology as it applies to art, both in architecture and, you know, sculpture and, and obviously the visual, like, you know, every kind of VR thing. So basically, like any technological enthusiast, I always try to use the great latest and greatest thing just to see how it works and get the experience with it and hands on and kind of push the edge of what's possible. Do you, do you actually produce physical pieces as well or is it all digital? Um, I have done a tiny bit of producing physical pieces um, and uh, when I got involved in the visual arts it was through um, when I was dating a sculptor and actually I was started as a model interestingly enough and she was I was painted as like a fresco in a in a church as like the Archangel Michael in, in, in Florence or something like that so I was um I kind of like got basically into the world of like the old kind of Florentine you know sculptural uh community but I have not personally gone the full circuit actually well that's not totally true because I have Burning Man installations like we brought this giant um uh metal things called like the spartan now it was kind of like a spartan warrior mask um and uh, with the burning missiles like some butterfly wings and other things to make it slightly less intimidating but i uh, kind of helped design some of these features like basically large metal steel installation art and tell me just going Here. back to when you were the model is your is that image still on a church wall someplace yeah mm -hmm. can you are you allowed to reveal the location um, I Maybe not. No, no, no. It's, 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 good. it's good enough for me to know that your image here, is on a church. Floor. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. That is so amazing. Sorry, I just have like this. It's amazing. So then you have some other eclectic, you have loads of eclectic stuff on your, on your, your personal website. Um, uh, from heaven to hell, an erotic operatic experience with truffles. What was that all about? Well, it's actually my birthday um, jamboree, but... Um, I like created, I did some art and photography for a while as a series um, and found um, that some of the um, photography I did was very stimulating to, uh, to other people um, and uh, kind of like bringing together some of like the Tantra energy kind of flow with photography with some kind of like eroticism, but in like less of a pornographic sense, more of like energetic and kind of sensual sense. 
Um, and so a friend of mine who was a professional oracle kind of tarot reader said, let's take your art and make it into like a tarot deck. Um, so that process kind of mostly completed about a year ago, but um, the kind of thought of basically bringing in everything into this sort of like symphonic arrangement or something of that um, was kind of re-articulated recently. And so we brought a bunch of really interesting like artists and creators to kind of bring it together from people who've been, you know, professionally involved in let's say the Tantra world to other people who are in more of the musical world and um, seeing kind of like almost like an artist workshop, like what we can create together. And why did you choose opera as opposed to say house or trance or rap or? It's partially the location. When I was there before, I somehow got in an operatic mood and um, I'm a big Philip Glass fan. Ah. And, um, I had just come back from Egypt and like I was listening to his, um, you know, Egyptian opera, I guess it's a, a ten. I was um, mispronounce it, but a Temkin or, um, and uh, anyways, yeah, the, the, and it was very like moving to me and kind of inspired me because it takes some of the stuff from the you know, Egyptian book of the dead and these kind of Oracle texts and kind of like contemplating like, you know, what does Horace mean in the 21st century or some of these things? Cause I definitely know a lot of people who feel I, like somehow connected to like ancient Egypt and kind of exploring like what that means. For, for all of us, I guess. Wow, interesting. Okay, that was, I didn't expect that answer. Um, you've written a lot of books, uh, Rise of the Crypto Kings, love the title, I haven't read it, sorry. But I also love you, um, You do you wear your heart on your sleeve? You've written Monkey Love, a book about love and love poetry to your partner, I think, is that right? Yeah, I'm in a sort of failed romance of mine, ultimately, but um, yeah, the, I think the, there's some different people, they evoke different things from you, you know, and it's very interesting, I think, writing poetry is a way of kind of getting into the details of the feeling, you know, of what it is that someone evokes. And in this particular case, you know, it's a little bit less like classical romance, although I, I love classical romance um, as well. And more like, what is the kind of free spirited expression of the jungle? And, you know, kind of that's why it's called like monkey love, because this particular person that I wrote some of these poems to and was there um, seemed to exhibit that kind of just free spiritedness um, that I thought was beautiful. And she also had a kind of monkey related band as well. <laughs> All the different layers. Amazing. Designers of Ethereum. So that was quite interesting to find out. I missed that yeah. bit of your pardon. Could you repeat? One of the design, the Ethereum like logo and stuff like that was also in the same monkey band, so monkey oh, business. That's interesting. It all ties up together. Wow. Um, and then tell me then uh, the holonic system. You've written a, a book about this too as well. I had to go and Google it. And the best explanation I, I discovered was the body could be considered a holonic system and like the heart and the lungs and the liver, whatever. They're independent, autonomous, but they act together as the hold. Is that a good explanation, or do you can you maybe do, give me a better one? And yeah, I think there's, there's kind of a descriptive and to some degree a prescriptive, you know, element to it. And one is, you know, how can we decide to describe, you know, elegantly like organizational design and how different things, you know, group together at different levels. And, you know, once you start looking at biological systems, you see that we have a lot of complex systems and the human body is a complex system. And, you know, if we just think about the mind at the top of a pyramid, it's actually maybe not a very good way to think about how the body works because we have all of these integrative parts and, the, you know, the way in which we come up with decisions and, you know, even at the cellular level, what's happening. So kind of thinking of things basically as nested systems, um, that each have their own degree of complexity is one of the key insights, I think, of like holonic philosophy. And then how we go from, you know, human systems at human biology, because a lot of times we're thinking of like ourselves as autonomous individuals, which maybe it can be a goal, but real, realistically, we also exist as part of larger social organization, organizations, whether it's at the ethnic level, which is kind of one clear thing, or the family level, or the nation level, or the supranational organization level, or whatever, you know. So there's all of these different things that we're kind of participating in, either consciously or non-consciously. 
um, kind of the founder of like libertarian thought on Mises um, was really kind of into this. And I think that's kind of his core insight into philosophy is that we need to be more conscious about the actual organizations we participate in and explicitly participate in them consciously. So he wasn't like hostile, for example, to the Catholic church, even though many people are today, but he was hostile to totalitarian mechanisms that basically force people to do it without their own ability to self-reflect on their associations. Um, and I think that in some ways this is consistent with that because, you know, the more that you self-reflect and realize all the different layers effectively of your existence, you know, the more, and this is where it gets a little bit into the prescriptive element, you can optimize for the health and sustainability and whatever other kind of metrics you think are important of each individual, you know, element in the nested structure. So obviously you're not going to be healthy if your cells of your body are not healthy, you know, you're not going to be your if your heart is not healthy, you're not going to be healthy. If your mind is all over the place, you're not going to be able to exist as a functional, high-performing human organism. And, you know, you can kind of apply that at different levels of the kind of nesting, but kind of, I think, starting with the, the kind of idea as well here, starting with the lowest level and then applying it outward in phases, you know, is a very good way of doing that because then you don't need to go into some ideological totalitarian whatever it is kind of mechanism to say well you know this thing you know um one of my favorite ones is actually this dr seuss book i don't know if you're a dr seuss fan oh i am big green eggs and hell yeah. yeah anyways he has this one that I, I grew up on called the bitter butter battle i don't know if you know it it's one Not of that one, lesser, lesser known pieces of dr seuss but it basically goes about these two people who live on the opposite sides of the wall and one of them butters their bread with the butter side up and the other is the butter side down, you know, and which, and then basically have this long standing feud over which is the right way. And so they basically end up doing this arms race where they keep building bigger weapons, you know, starting with rocks and slingshots and moving up to, you know, the Dr. Seuss equivalent of nuclear missiles to basically convince the other side that it's like the right way, you know? And we can see these sort of like escalating systems of violence and various things and often very kind of pointless um, uh, applications of those things. So I think there's basically an offset of ways that once we kind of do that, we can kind of step away from some of these, let's say, destructively violent tendencies that have, um, you know, not been great for evolution on this no. planet. Or, or had who, who won in, in the uh, Dr. Zeus book or, or do they just kill each other? There's kind of a spoiler alert if I say this, and I don't think I can. I think I have to recommend that you get the book yourself. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, I will get the book. Now I'm mad curious to know. It reminds me of, you know, the fable where the, the two small monkeys are fighting over a piece of cheese and, and who has the most, and then the, the sage monkey comes on, and he takes a bite off one side, and then a bite keeps on. Anyway, he eats the, the cheese because he takes a bite that can't agree. So anyway. right. So that is very interesting. Okay, I'm learning lots of things here. So going back to then, you're a founder member with Ethereum. So as a 13-year-old child, Bitcoin wasn't invented, one presumes then, was it? No. So no, you were into for... cryptography at that stage? Uh, not issue? particularly. Normally, I was interested um, in the history of ciphers, you know, because it's actually interesting. Again, like a literary thing, but um, kind of like the founding director of the NSA. I don't know if you know very much about the or or origins of that one. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's created in the Second World War and then um, kind of became formalized actually in kind of the Cold War. But the guy who basically kicked it all off, uh, you know, was whatever, working on ciphers. But the reason he got interested in this whole thing was through this uh, Edgar Allan Poe short story called The Gold Book, you know. Um, I'm a big fan. I don't know that one. You're, you're exposing yeah, so my ignorance. Or no history of whatever cryptography, so to speak, because it's actually very interesting, you know, about how to embed ciphers in this, you know, treasure map quest for some sunken, you know, hidden treasure. And that has a number of, you know, interesting twists and turns. But, you know, I think in some ways, um, the history of like hidden messages, you know, is much broader than the formal science of cryptography, because cryptography as a let's say mathematical discipline is almost a subset of the overall thing of how to pass um, hidden messages, you know, that transfer communication of which there's a lot of things that, you know, are not formal mathematical systems. And I think it all is very interesting, um, but public key cryptography as we know it 
Um, and, and this is again, kind of like academic thing in some way, but I think it's actually a really important thing that many people miss since I'm like rambling about many topics. Um, <laughs> it's, this is good. This is a good ramble. Is based on an idea of number theory that's totally un unproven, basically. Like all of the modern cryptographic systems are based in this like random idea in number theory that prime numbers have no patterns associated with them. And no one's really proven that. It's just like basically this hypothesis and no one found any good patterns because, you know, people have only been working on it for like, you know, whatever, 80 years or something like that. Formerly, there weren't even computers to do stuff for a while. So, you know. I like, did not know that. Is 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 that known? Uh, is that generally known that number theory is theory? It's, it's, it's known by people who like study the things behind, you know, stuff. Mm. Like basically, number theory is a theory. It includes a lot of different things about the nature of numbers. Many of them are unproven because it's very hard to prove these things. And then as a result, people build things that are application areas. And some of those people, they don't study the theory at all. I mean, how many people trading NFTs like know or care about? cryptography in the first place and then how many people who study cryptography really know about what cryptography is based on so wow. that's okay. bad well, that interested you that, that that's how you got in so when you heard about bitcoin when did you hear about it and did you go aha or did you go nah, maybe uh i was kind of skeptical i think it was like 2009 2010 i read technical news like all the time so i'm on top of most like broad technical trends mm -hmm. um and I was like, this is like a nerd currency. It's not going to succeed. And some of the Bitcoiners were always like, always evangelizing Bitcoin. And I was kind of annoyed to like, kind of, kind of you know, had that little bit of like Ponzi psychology, like you must do Bitcoin now, blah, 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 kind of thing associated with it. Um, but I thought it was interesting enough to like read all the stuff behind it and kind of try to figure out how I was doing um, the stuff. And, uh, and then I started trying to innovate in the digital currency area myself, like um, as an entrepreneur and kind of do more. I was already involved a little bit alternative economy stuff. I realized it's like basically impossible to make any kind of currency, new type of financial system, even money transfer stuff is devilishly difficult to get off the ground because people have so many like licenses and regulations and no one wants you to do anything um, that's like threatening to the existing financial system or these alternative systems. So then they all had kind of scale problems, whatever else. And then um, and then a lot of them were shut down by governments as well, like the whole DigiCash and Eagle. And I mean, I talked with the founders of many of these projects. And then I was like, Bitcoin is, is the answer to all these problems. <laughs> so I kind of came at it like very strongly convinced, but kind of from a reluctant, you know, somewhat pessimistic appraisal of the way the whole kind of, you know, financial over superstructure worked. And from that standpoint, I've kind of been a, you know, uh, I don't say enthusiastic adopter, but I've been very enthusiastic about the sort of what the world of innovation that it's opening up, um, even though I don't really think that Bitcoin is the final answer to any of the, the issues. So it's part. Yeah. So, for example, um, I imagine then um, with like DeFi, is that something I know it's a bit crazy and it, it's a bit like, oh, we're all in here and we're all in there and we're doing this and the other. But it's um, it, it, it's mind blowing. Do you, do you find it or do you, do you think that's going to eat up the banks and eat up the world or? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I just think like, you know, there's, you get a bunch of programmers, you know, and people like me, we're used to building shit and we like to build shit. And then you just let them build things and they're going to build cool things. Like basically that's what it is. <laughs> and some of those things over time are going to become more sophisticated than, you know, people who are old and sitting in their armchairs, you know, like watching, you know, whatever, like pieces of paper, you know, it's going to get rapidly more sophisticated than these existing workflows. And, you know, and people are going to make a lot of money doing it in, in this case because it's a lot more financial applications. So, mm, so then bringing you on to say that, oh, sorry, not to say that there aren't issues, you know, I like, yeah. but no, I, I think that's it's, it's any emerging tech is going to have issues and it's such an exciting time, it's going to have issues on steroids <laughs> because it's going so fast. Um, so you then, um, your current project is Art Wallet, so NFTs. Did you, I mean. NFTs, we all, even our grannies know NFTs these days, but um, when you first heard of them, did, did they make sense to you or, or did it take a while or where are you on the NFT and, and what kind of sense do they make to you? Well, um, I think, you know, NFTs is basically one way of referring to a digital asset or a stamp of ownership idea has been around for 
a long time. Um, but it's great that now lots of people care about it and want to do something with it. And it's reached some kind of popular tipping over point. I also have an agency that represents a bunch of celebrities. So we did the Mike Tyson drop, which you know, broke a bunch of records on, you know, OpenSea. And we have kind of this other, you know, wall infrastructure, like I said. And um, I think still it's like a very immature space, even though there's a lot of buzz and excitement, but lots of people building, you know, marketplaces, relatively few um, building like anything I would consider like core infrastructure. Um, and in fact, the kind of things that are needed to do that, because even like kind of the economics models are not really good for kind of persistent, you know, long-term value of these things. They're good for like short-term speculation, but it kind of guarantees effectively the way it is that they're going to come back down to zero or near zero for in a lot of these cases. So um, obviously it's like exciting to speculate, but I think the way that the NFT space has evolved is basically out of CryptoKitties model, which is a collect, you know, a basically speculating a betting game that involves, you know, collectibles. So people don't really, people are there to bet. They're not there because they really think the cats are really super cute or they want to put one up on their wall or anything like that. Um, and they're certainly not there for the art value. And so sometimes people, I think, get the wrong idea about the NFT value thing because people somehow like, you know, associate with art or other things. And um, it's basically like a giant speculative game at the moment. Um, but there's, there's this raising awareness. And then the kind of cool thing about it is that we can build in economic models, the insurance, the bankable assets, a lot of other things that can, that can come in behind NFTs and basically really be the second generation of these technologies. So I'm actually, I'm somewhat exposed in the first generation. I have an NFT portfolio. I've kind of tried pretty much every platform, all that, but I'm very seriously building kind of a, what I would call the second generation kind of infrastructure. You know, similar to when I started MetaMask, it's kind of obvious to me that this was like the next thing that was needed was, you know, this type of um, browser integration uh, yeah. to basically uh, allow people to use the web browser to do things. And now it's kind of pretty obvious to me that we need to basically open up this other layer of what we'd say, even to access into the traditional um, media and entertainment industry and kind of how some of these people do things. So a lot of like, people have already taken, you know, financial allocation in, um, in our wallet are people who you know are kind of bridging those two worlds so it's exciting and, and and bridging is a word that's applied to a lot isn't it you're a bridger academic and, and real world academic and art um, and and where is the art wallet at at the moment so you're saying that people are investing in it is it is it in what, what's the roadmap for it i have a private i'll force you doing a drop um at nft basel which was just in a couple of days now that is a kind of the first crypto apollo drop um, and uh, one really cool thing is this kind of acting like a mystery box where someone who gets one of these things will actually get a physical car, one of these NFT um, wrapped cars by this uh, artist Vesa. Um, so that's very exciting. And An basically, we're doing car or card, car, C A R, car, car, like one that you can drive a yes. physical. Wow, car. wow. So basically, yeah, we're we're kind of already you know bridging into let's say real world objects um, from the very beginning and being natively cross-chain because we're doing this on both Ethereum and kind of BSC um, from the beginning. And people will obviously through, you know, their crypto calls will be able to redeem these physical objects. And um, yeah, all that is kind of going to be in the first release of the kind of art wallet platform. So that's, that's cool. exciting. So when you get, I'm not saying, I mean, uh, cheeky now, when you get bored of this project, what's the next project? Do you, do you have your next projects lined up all the time or, or do you just go where, where your curiosity takes you? Um, yeah, well, these days I only really bring on projects where there's like a solid CEO um, in place kind of already or, you know, at least CTO that can maybe step in and take on some of those roles because, you know, partially temperamentally, I'm, I'm not inclined to kind of be in this sort of long term thing, just as you mentioned. So even though I can you know continue sparkling fairy dust or what have you. Um, so, yeah, I always I have like about two significant business ideas per week. Um, or three that I write into pretty much full business plans at the time and then kind of wait until I find a team um, that can potentially execute on it. Um, so and uh, so I have like, you know, let's say 50 on my desktop at this moment of which, you know, 10 have gone through some sort of initial vetting process of, uh, of a team and um, two or three seem likely to go. One is kind of a voxel art universe um, another one is this kind of like metronome tracking kind of music practice app. But I don't think it's going to be a mainstream thing. It's going to be more thing. And then some kind of private social network stuff as well. So, you know, there, but then, you know, I only really have time to help scale up 
one project at a time. So mm-hmm. kind of all my time goes into that for, you know, the six to eight week period it takes to really get it up and going. Then usually I do some more like researchy topics for a while and then, you know, kind of wait for the next one. So that's how it's going right now. Um, wow. So we'll see. But sometimes these projects go, go a little bit dark, you know, like they don't always need to be public and have a lot of attention, you know, mm-hmm. when they're kind of building infrastructure like metamask for a while was like pretty dark for like a couple of years before like people really started like caring about it you know mm-hmm. so do you sleep much highlink uh, went for some period where i thought i could sleep every other day and that turned out to be like a huge disaster uh, for my health so um although i was like very like oh i can do this uh, for a while so uh, these days yeah it's pretty core cool for me to get sleep and exercise, I think, like, it just keeps me very, like, focused and efficient to kind of be in, like, execution mode. Yeah, because yeah. you were talking earlier about the the, the um, holonic system. Everything needs to be in balance. No, that's so cool. I thank you so much. I'm very, I'm very, like, competitive, you know, temperamentally and staccato in my, like, metronome. I like to think have things happen at a certain kind of pace, you know. So, you know, whatever, the Allegro of, you know, Beethoven's seventh or something like that, you know, with the appropriate crescendos and kind of pacing so and i just love that kind of stuff like even like how type raisers some of these online typing things i always try to like improve my you know words per minute and you know various output metrics so uh, i think we should all adopt that my kids tell me when I, I'm, I'm a journalist so i type thousands of words but i never learned to really type because my age whatever so um i I, I delete as many words as I write. Imagine if I didn't, didn't hit the delete button so much. I'd have tens of novels written at this stage. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you so much for your time, Joel. It's, it's been an amazing experience. I've loved chatting with you. I love hearing you do it. I want to keep in contact. So thank you indeed for your time. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. So, thank and, you. Uh, yeah, great.